Okay, so let's let's begin. Um, we'll turn and first to our Blessed Mother. So we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners God of love, open our hearts to you. Draw us deeper into your love. Teach us how to pray. And may we, uh, through John Toller's influence and in prayers, have come to be those Dominicans you're calling us to be. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Saint Dominic, pray for us. Saint Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. John Toller, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> <laughs> well, no one's scandalized by that, but I, I pray to John Toller. <laughs> You're allowed to pray to people, you know, privately. Blesses and saints. And he's, you know, we don't know. I think the only reason he's not blessed is because we don't know much about his life. Whereas blessed Henry Suso, he was beatified in the 1800s. And, you know, so 400 years after his life. Um, but we had we have an account of his life, so that certainly helps the <laughs> beatification and canonization process. Um, so yeah, so John Toller, we have his sermons. We know a little bit about his life from what he mentions in his sermons, and we knew we know he was very influential in the Friends of God movement. So you'll be known by your fruits. The tree is judged by his fruits, and he had some good fruits in his life. Um, so I think a good holy soul. And it's nice, you know, some, since he's not beatified or canonized, not many people are praying to him. <laughs> so he can uh, direct his attention to us. You are? Do you know? Oh. Well, I just want to know. <laughs> I just sort of, did he have like a cult following after his death that like, you know, became like a local saint, even though the church didn't declare him a saint? Do you know? Good question. There, there must be because um, the classics of Western spirituality volume on Toller which is frustrating because it's short. Um, it has an image from the, his tomb. Mm -hmm. you know, so that image was inscribed, inscribed in it on his tomb. And so, I mean, you don't do that just for uh, <laughs> everybody. Um, you, know, you might remember their name or something, but to inscribe his image, um, signal, you know, capture something. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, yeah, what, so that, but certainly had a following in his writings, uh, he had an influence after his death. Um, John of the Cross was very much influenced by him, as we'll see a little bit later. A big, a key for the Rhineland mystics, what helped them um, gain more of an influence was Lawrence Surius, who was a Carthusian in like the 15 or 1600s. And he was part of uh, the German charter house uh, that just did a lot of copying manuscripts. And so Lawrence Surius translated the Rhineland mystics and also in John Roosbrook. So he translated like Eckhart and then Tauler and Henry Suso um, and blessed John Roosbrook from German into Latin. <laughs> And as uh, Dom Philip, an old Carthusian I knew who taught some classes on the Rhino Mystics, uh, so they were translated into international fame. <laughs> That's the way he put it. The Rhino Mystics were translated into international fame. So now they were available in Latin and everyone had access to them. So that was, that was important. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, so if you want, well, if you want to. Uh, I have all this. Okay. So Lawrence Surius, S-U-R-I-U-S, Carthusian, lived 1522 to 78. Uh, Dom Philip Dahl, so he's a Carthusian at the Vermont Charter House, and I read some of his conference notes about the Rhineland Mystics. 
He says, with serious translation work into Latin, Toller, Suso, and Roosbrook were translated into international fame uh, 200 years after their life. So at age 26, Surius translated Toller. At age 30, he translated Roosbrook, and at age 33, Suso. It's interesting, um, Lawrence Surius, uh, before he entered the Carthusians, uh, he studied at Cologne, and he was roommates with uh, St. Peter Canisius, who's actually a doctor of the church, a Jesuit doctor of the church. And this Jesuit doctor of the church was really interested in the Rhineland mystics as well. And so he came up with a work where he brought together Suso, Toller, and Eckhart, and Roosbrook, and maybe a couple others, and called them the institutions, or the institutes, institutions, I think, uh, and then just slapped the name John Toller on them. Uh, so there's a work that was attributed to John Toller, the institutes, that's actually a collection of Eckhart, uh, Suso and Tyler, um, and it was um, this doctor of the church, Lawrence Surius, who kind of brought them together. I think he had another work too where he brought um, these kind of three thinkers together. So it is sort of an interesting thing. Okay, Suso is beatified, so that gives kind of a church's approval in a way to kind of the best at what came from the, the Rhineland mystics. And then to have this doctor of the church uh, Peter Canisius translating even Eckhart and having an interest in Eckhart, um, yeah, I think is gives something of some weight and authority to uh, this whole movement. <clears throat> it, you know, so Canisius he helped. So Lawrence Surius was raised Catholic, but then fell away into Lutheranism, you know, in Germany in that time. And then uh, so Peter Canisius helped convert Lawrence back to Catholicism. And then um, as a Carthusian, he uh, translates um, these figures into Latin. Too bad he didn't know English. <laughs> but it would have helped us now. Um, okay, so the, the title for this whole series of talks is Abyss Calls to Abyss at the Cross of Jesus. John Toller's spirituality. So that's a big theme for him. And, you know, the Rhineland Mystics and you know, John Toller especially, it's about going deeper with the Lord, deeper in our prayer life. The depths of our soul crying out to the depths of God. For you'll remember from three months ago when we talked about the Beguines, um, this theme of the double abyss, the abyss of God's plenitude and the abyss of our nothingness and the meeting of the two. Uh, so that was very popular with the Beguines, Angela Foligno, Hadwick of Antwerp. And so as you know, you learned three months ago, the Beguines influenced the Friars, influenced Eckhart, influenced John Toller and, and Suso. And the Dominican nuns that Toller would have preached to, you know, they would have been in that climate that they would have been influenced by that piety as well of the Beguines um, a century earlier and even you know, in their own day. So that, that's the, the context, and so that's a, a key theme for Toller, this abyss caused to abyss. And something that's great about John Toller is that uh, Jesus is always at the center of it. So that's why I'm calling this abyss caused to abyss at the cross of Jesus. And so almost every sermon, Jesus you know, is at least mentioned or you know, uh, is more central. And that's different than, say, like Eckhart. Sometimes in Eckhart, Jesus kind of fades out of the picture, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but Tyler is very good at keeping him, uh, the Lord Jesus, front and center, even as he speaks about abyss calls to abyss. So he wants to take us deep, but he never kind of loses sight of kind of the concrete and the lowly as well. So you know, the depths of contemplation, but he also always talks about the place of vocal prayer and um, external prayer and, you know, community prayer in the, the midst of that and gives some pretty good accounts of how they're related. Um, you know, this this first conference, I would call the sublime, I would call it sublime humility and Jesus Christ. So um, so this is a, a key theme for, for Tyler is sublime humility 
which I hope sounds a little paradoxical because it, it's supposed to be. <laughs> but you know, think about the humility of Mary. She's certainly the lowly handmaid of the Lord, yet it's such a sublime humility and she, she is lifted uh, so high to the Lord. And so the two are together in her. And so for John Toller, um, a key theme is the sublime humility. I'd right? say so that's what's distinctive about him, his, his account of this. Uh, and it's, it's really rich. He says in one sermon, this is page 765, which is referred to this big, thick volume, um, Walter Elliott, the editor from around 1900. Uh, he says, God is in the abyss of our humility. So uh, abyss calls to abyss. And so for Tyler, there's a lot of looking at the abyss of the soul as it mirrors God, the interior desert. Um, and just the, the expanse of the soul and how deep the soul is. And so he speaks a lot about the ground, the ground of, of the soul. And that was important for Eckhart as well, the ground of the soul, uh, the depths, um, the innermost depths of the soul. So he opens that up a bit for us and uh, rooted in the abyss of our humility. Uh, well, that's where you find God. God is in the abyss of our humility, he says. And that line, if I had to capture Tyler in eight words, you would do, uh, it would be hard to find a better by than that. God is in the abyss of our humility. If I wanted to um, slap a scripture verse over all these conferences as capturing it, it would be 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And the next couple of verses too, three verses are very much in line with Tyler. So you know, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 10. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So with the Lord Jesus, his, his death and resurrection and our share in that, um, that's very much at the heart of Tyler as well. So Tyler's specialty, I would say, is this sublime account of humility and sort of the interiority of humility. So, you know, think about St. Benedict. He gives us, um, is it the 12 steps of humility? I've only gotten to like step two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you know, we have the 12 steps of uh, humility in, in St. Benedict, and you know, St. Bernard comments on, on that as well with the treatise. Um, but you have in the rule of St. Benedict the, these 12 steps of humility, and there you get, you know, so humility is very important for Benedict as well, of course. And there you get more of the external actions that make us humble, the humble acts and practices we need to do and engage in. So, you know, we certainly need, we need that. But I would say Toller's distinctiveness is that he opens up the interiority of humility. So we wanna do the humble acts and practices following Benedict, following your rule. Um, but then to appreciate the interiority of humility is when Toller comes in and is really helpful. Right, because, you know, a Benedictine can like exteriorly do everything he needs to be doing or should be doing, yet interiorly can be kind of lacking um, a complete resonance with that. I mean, that's another key thing for, for Tyler is bringing the interiority into accord with the exteriority or helping us not to just get like caught up in the, not doing the externals as robots, not falling asleep, not you know being alive within interior, interiorly as we go about our external practices. He says, and I think it's kind of a little jab against 
the monks or something or <laughs> the, um, just a little one that, um, you know, kind of the monastic life, you know, the Carthusians, especially, you know, to pray more means to add more Psalms to what, you know, to your day. <laughs> so Carthusians just is loaded up with Psalms. And that was kind of the, the way of the Middle Ages. Um, and then, so Toller says at one point, you know, chanting and reciting, you know, chanting and singing, um, you know, God wants your heart. He doesn't want songbirds. Uh, he wants your heart. And so, you know, really emphasizing that, yeah, okay, do the chanting, um, but make sure your heart is there as well. The interiority is, is attuned to it. And yeah, the life of holiness is not necessarily adding more psalms uh, to your life. Going deeper in prayer doesn't necessarily mean adding more practices. It means going deeper into them, coming with a richer interiority to, to what you're already doing. So in um, Toller, we have a good account of this interiority of humility, making it just showing us how beautiful humility is and how it's helpful in our union with God. And then that, of course, inspires us to do the things that we need to do to become humble and to um, face the difficulties we need to face uh, to be humbled by the Lord and uh, purified of our pride and humility. So we can think of the, you know, there's active humility and passive humility, acts that we do that help cultivate the virtue of humility. There's also that passive humility of acts God does <laughs> on us or the events of day-to-day -day life, things that happen you know, that contradict us, people who contradict us, our plans uh, don't go as we want. And you know, that builds up humility as well, sort of in, in a, a passive, receptive way. Divine providence humbling you. There's also acquired humility, but there's also uh, infused humility. So, you know, we can examine ourselves, grow in self-knowledge, and that's good and that's helpful, make our examinations of conscience and uh, open our souls to the Lord. Um, but there are also times, so that's acquired humility, or that, you know, it's our efforts in growing humility. But there are times where you're brought into the presence of the Lord, and just in the midst of his grandeur, you see how small you are. That would be more infused humility, coming from infused contemplation. Um, and so the more we appreciate who God is, his, his grandeur, yeah, the smaller we see ourselves to be. And that's a gift of God. It comes in prayer often. John Toller, he does, you know, talk about ascending to God, the ascent to God. But his preferred way of, of speaking about the journey to God is sinking sinking into the ground, sinking, you know, sinking into the ground of the soul, sinking into God, into his depths. So that's his preferred way of speaking about like progress in the spiritual life. It's a sinking more than an ascending, sinking into the depths. And so that captures too something of this sublime humility. So we'll, we'll see more about that. So John Toller says in uh, one sermon, um, before everything else, a person shall set himself in nothingness. In order to attain the crown of perfection, there is nothing more important than to sink down into the deepest ground and into the root of humility. Just as a tree's height comes out of its deepest root, so too everything that is high in the spiritual life comes from the ground of humility. Right, I think, yeah, I think that is the case, right? Or, you know, the roots of the tree, you know, they go out as far as like the branches go out. Is that true? Maybe not. <laughs> you know, so you have, you have a wide, expansive tree and the branches, that means the roots under the ground have gone out that far. Right, yeah, at least, you know, this is kind of the, the thinking here. Uh, and then the thinking here, you know, as high as the tree goes, well, that's because the root has gone that low below. So there, there's certainly some truth to that uh, on the natural level. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly very true in the spiritual life. So again, I mean, so we'll be talking a lot about this, this nothingness. And just so you kind of, you know, appreciate it. I mean, we saw the context three months ago with the Beguines. 
and kind of this talk of our nothingness um, that um, you know metaphysically it's not it's not literally true metaphysically um, but you know we are nothing without God we literally are nothing if God wasn't holding us in existence um, and that we are very small but we think we're bigger than we are and so we do need you know the language of the mystics is to create a disposition in our soul to bring us into kind of a stance, a position. And so our pride, to kind of counteract with our pride, we do need kind of this language of our nothingness, or it can be helpful. And you know, Catherine of Siena is in this context as well. As God says to her, I am he who is, you are she who is not. And Raymond of Capua notes that that was foundational for St. Catherine's spiritual life. And we can see how that kind of thinking does help us get to that place we need to be of, of humility. So that, that's the language of, of the mystics. And so just to, you know, you learn as you study spiritual theology, as you study the spiritual life, just how to hear those things um, and how to both utilize them. You know, working on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and uh, I had, we had this, um, this young woman who did some translating for us. She, she knew French. Uh, I don't know any French um, of St. Elizabeth's writings. And so some of this language of like self-abnegation and like disappearing in God, um, she thought was like too severe. So she kind of like tried to translate it out or like soften the translation. <laughs> because no, I mean, we are nothing. God does, you know, he loves us. We, we are something, you know, yeah, she has a point. Um, kind of our, our modern concern. Um, and yeah, you know, there's truth to that. Um, I mean, we aren't actually, you know, nothing in God's sight. He loves us, we're treasured by him. And it's not like lack of self-esteem that these mystics are kind of drawing us to. Um, and so we're kind of protective against that. So anyway, so she tries to translate this stuff out or soften it, but it's like, well, you miss kind of the whole like point of the mystics. <laughs> So, yeah, so with Tyler, you know, his language can be excessive at times. So just we just have to know how to, uh, to listen to that. It's, it's a style of the mystics, and it has its purpose. Uh, it's to counteract our excessive self-love, our excessive pride. Um, to counteract that, it's helpful to think about God as he who is, and we as those who are not. And it helps us to enter into that place of humility. So we have to just as we get as we listen to John Tyler, don't like get turned off by the language sometimes, because uh, it is strong and you know it is excessive if you want to read it in like a literal sense at times. Um, but you know it, it's the poetry of the mystics, and it is creating something in our spirit. Uh, and if you translate it out, it's like okay, <laughs> what's the point of reading Elizabeth of the Trinity here? <laughs> It's, off the, it's also important to realize that Tyler is about fine-tuning the dial. You know, you think of the old radios, you have the coarse dial that, you know, you move it a, a lot. You move it and the, the dial moves a lot. Um, where the fine-tuning, you have to really turn it a lot just to turn a little. And so Tyler is on that level of fine-tuning. Um, so he's not just, so some of his language, you know, he's not just concerned about avoiding sin. He wants to avoid like all imperfection. He wants to avoid anything that kind of keeps our heart from God. It might not be strictly sinful, uh, but he's fine tuning. He wants to, to draw us to that place where we are focused on God alone and that we see all things in God and that everything is ordered to God. And so he's great for you know, monastic life and uh, religious life more broadly. But to appreciate yeah, when he does talk, you know, some of this language, he's not just wanting us to avoid sin, uh, but to have our hearts fixed on, on God alone. You know, so like he, he does, you know, he's clear at places about created things, the goodness of created things and the, how, how they're helpful and are sent to God. Uh, but then there are times where he's very strong um, about our attachments to created things for the sake of having this pure heart totally focused on God. 
Um, and so, yeah, again, to learn, to, you know, to know how to hear um, passages like that and how to interpret them correctly. So, you know, like for you, so it's not this whole thing. It's not like a question, okay, John Tyler or like St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, it's not like you're, you're trying to replace um, like Aquinas's balanced, you know, good account of things. Should I replace it with Tyler? No, it's more like Tyler, you know, Aquinas doesn't address everything. Um, and it's like Tyler builds, you know, Tyler takes Aquinas as an authority as well and quotes him at times. And so if Aquinas helps us kind of dial in big picture, um, then we should see Tyler building on that with kind of some of the fine tuning and using you know, more mystical language. I mean, you just consider I'm Aquinas, the Summa Theologiae, he has uh, one question on prayer. Uh, you know, question 83, the second part of the second part. Um, and I'm uh, obviously other parts of the Summa touch on uh, the, the question of prayer. Um, but where St. Thomas has one question on prayer, um, you know, Tyler has like 75 sermons, <laughs> particularly on it, and you know, uh, find detailed questions about prayer. So to, um, yeah, just appreciate that. And to read Tyler in the context of the Catholic tradition and Catholic teaching. Um, okay, so one thing about very nice about John Tyler, so since he is preaching about the liturgical year, um, his sermons are kind of very balanced. You get a very balanced spirituality, drawing in all the mysteries of Christ. So, you know, going through the table of contents here, he has a number of sermons for Advent, you know, four or five sermons on Christmas, sermons on Lent, um, Holy Week, a few sermons, Easter, the Ascension, he has like five sermons. Pentecost is very important for him, five or six sermons. Uh, the Blessed Trinity, uh, he has, I think, three sermons. Corpus Christi, so you get a good account of the Eucharist, and he has five or six sermons on the Eucharist. Um, and so the sacraments are front and center for John Tyler, especially the Eucharist, as Christ is. And then, yeah, unfolding the spiritual life in, in this light. He also, you know, some sermons on the saints in here as well, especially John the Baptist, as well on St. Matthew, and of course Our Lady as well. There's something very uh, bright about John Tyler. So he's very realistic about the difficulties we face in, in life and the trials in the spiritual life, but there's a, a brightness that pervades it all. Uh, he says in one sermon, to be with Jesus on the mountain is a joyous and beautiful thing, but it's hard work climbing to the top. <laughs> it's hard work climbing to the top, but it's great being up there. Um, free your heart of all its preoccupations and let your spirit be free to soar to God. That is what he created it to do, just as he created fire to rise and birds to fly. So he created your soul to ascend to him, so to free it of its preoccupations. So there's a great confidence here uh, that we are made for God and that he is drawing us to himself. Um, and so, yeah, difficulties, he's real, realistic about, but also great optimism and a brightness to it all. There's a, a story from John Tyler's life, uh, which, you know, scholars can question whether it's actually him, applies to him or not, but, uh, but they question everything. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever the, I mean, this certainly captures key themes and Tyler and things about him. So there, uh, so John Tyler, um, you know, a very learned man, uh, early in his Dominican years. <coughs> he prays for eight years, pleading with the Lord to send him a master in the spiritual life to teach him how to get to God. So he, he's crying out to the Lord for eight years, praying for the Lord, send me someone, a spiritual master, to teach me. Um, and then one day uh, that master shows up, right? The beggar. <laughs> a beggar comes to John Tyler. And uh, so John Tyler, you know, okay, so he's approached by a beggar. And so John Tyler says to him, you know, ah, oh, good day. Good day to you, sir. 
And the beggar says, good day. I've never had a bad day. Uh, and the teller says, well, okay, well, God bless you. And then uh, the beggar says, I've never received anything from, from God but blessing. And why would you say God bless you? Okay. <laughs> I received nothing but blessings from God. Uh, okay, be at peace. I've never been anything but at peace. <laughs> and then Satala says, okay, explain that to me. And then the beggar says, when I am hungry, I praise the Lord. When I am cold, or it hails, or snows, or rains, if the air is clear or foggy, I praise God. If I am favored by men or despised, I praise him equally. And all this is why I have never known a bad day. And then Tyler, to challenge him a little bit, you know, so you know, he's laying out this way of surrender, loving surrender to the Lord, resignation to God's will, trustful abandonment to divine providence, praising God in everything. So Tyler kind of tries to challenge him some. Okay, what if God were to cast you to hell? And then the beggar says, even there, I would embrace God with my two arms, humility and love. And the beggar says, for hell with God would be more happy, would be happier for me than heaven without God. Hell with God would be better than heaven without God. And I would embrace him with my humility and love. So then Tyler says, well, who are you? <laughs> He's kind of beginning to be a little impressed by this beggar. Uh, who are you? And the beggar says, I'm a king. And then Tyler is like, well, where is your kingdom? In the depths of my soul. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tyler says, well, by what means have you gained this perfection? And then the beggar says, by silence, meditation, and union with God. I have never been able to find rest in anything, be it what it might, that was less than God. But I have found my God, and in him I have found rest and peace eternal. So yeah, so that was a great master that uh, God sent uh, John Tyler to teach him uh, the way to deep union with God. And it's the way of humility and loving surrender to the Lord, abandonment to God and his providence. And yeah, you know, this theme of the depths of the soul, your king, okay, where's your kingdom? Well, it's in my soul, the kingdom of God is within you. An important theme for John Tyler um, and the, the pursuit of God. Okay, so that, that captures a lot about John Tyler, his person, and uh, his spiritual doctrine. <clears throat> So, okay, here are um, 12 themes of John Power as we look at his spirituality as a whole. And I think they're quite attractive themes of Power. Um, he's very optimistic about our reaching a very deep union with God by grace, right? And this includes lay people, right? So he was involved in this Friends of God movement, uh, which involved a lot of fervent about lay people wanting to go deeper in the Lord. And then, you know, these, these nuns that he preached to, very optimistic about our reaching a very deep union with God, and that comes out in all his sermons. Uh, number two, and this kind of, you know, balances number one, but number, number two, but he's very realistic about things not always being as we might want or expect. So there's a lot in Tyler about, yeah, how we handle that. How do you handle it when your will is contradicted? How do you handle it when there's desolation and prayer and God seems far from you? So there's a lot about that. There's a lot about the dark night in John Power. You could, you could easily, from these 750 pages, you could draw together uh, 200 pages on the dark night. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very, it's, it's helpful because I mean, we do face difficulties in life. We do face dryness in prayer. So it's great to hear someone address those who's realistic about these things and shows us what God is doing and does it with the brightness, uh, with, with you know, great hope and confidence in the Lord. And so this is, you know, John of the Cross, he, he draws a lot from John Tyler. And you can see images that are used, that they both use, um, 
passages, you can see like, oh wow, this is you know, John Tyler, or John John the Cross is drawing in this this doctrine from John Tyler. So Tyler speaks a lot more about the Dark Knight than anyone before him. And the, the difficulties in prayer. Uh, a third theme of Tyler is abyss calls to abyss. And it's the abyss of God's plenitude. And then, yeah, the, the soul as an abyss, an interior desert, great depths to the soul uh, that come into contact with the depths of God. Number four, another theme of Tyler is that Jesus is at the center, especially Jesus in the Eucharist. You know, every sermon, Jesus is at least mentioned, if not spoken of more centrally. Uh, number five, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are key for John Tyler. In that sermon you read for Pentecost, he says we should celebrate Pentecost every day. Pentecost unfolds in our souls day by day. And so where in um, Eckhart, by comparison, um, for Eckhart it almost seems like at times like you're already in union with God and you just need to kind of realize it and see it. Um, but with Tyler, it's much more clear. You come into union with God through the sacraments, through Jesus, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what brings you into this deep mystical union with God. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are shared in the life of Christ. It, not that it was like already there and you're just kind of unveiling it. And so, yeah, very good, a beautiful theme there, and very helpful. Um, better than Toller's or uh, Eckhart's approach, I'd say. Um, number six, another key theme is the self being stripped. Poverty of spirit is key for John Toller. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's key for the Lord Jesus, too, <laughs> in his teaching. Number seven, the dark nights. Dark night of the senses, dark night of the spirit. Uh, plenty of pages, uh, John Toller, on those themes. Uh, number eight, trustful abandonment to God. Enjoy, always enjoy, praising the Lord like that beggar, whether it rains, whether it snows. Trustful abandonment to God uh, with that um, mark of joy. Uh, number nine, uh, prayers, fruitfulness for other souls or our interior life as being fruitful for other souls. So that's important for uh, Dominican nuns, especially. And that this is something that enters Christian spirituality in a more powerful way with the, with the Dominicans. So Catherine of Siena and John Powler speak about that much more than earlier writers. And they speak about it in a stronger and more compelling way that your hidden life um, in the monastery your hidden prayer, your offering yourselves to the Lord is fruitful for the world, is fruitful for the church, is fruitful for others. Um, and so they, Catherine of Siena and John Tyler, speak about that a lot more and in stronger ways than had been before them. Um, and yeah, that makes sense with the rising of the friar movements and the Dominicans preaching the salvation of souls, that that would come out more strongly in Dominican um, spiritual writers. Uh, number 10, um, Toller dedicates a good bit of space to uh, the proper use of creatures and meditation. So, you know, so he calls us to kind of the, the heights, the depths of, of prayer, uh, you know, even you know, like Im imageless prayer, but he's always then quick to, to talk about the place for meditation and study and reading and images. You know, it's like you're getting rid of all these images so you can focus on the image of Jesus. That's what he says. Uh, number 11, that's something else attractive about him, kind of very like clever images and expressions at times. Um, you know, yeah, chanting, reciting. God doesn't want songbirds, he wants your hearts. <laughs> so you can tell, you know, he's kind of, he had a good sense of humor. This comes out, clever expressions. Uh, and then number 12, the theme is these, what I mentioned earlier, is humility and the interior disposition of humility, the interior richness of humility. Here's a, a good summary of John Toller from a 
Benedictine nun of Stanbrook Abbey. You know, this is from like the 50s or 60s, anonymous Benedictine nun. And uh, she wrote a book called uh, The Medieval Mystical Tradition uh, Leading Up to St. John of the Cross. And so she's looking at how John of the Cross is influenced by the medieval mystical tradition. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the full title there. Um, but it, it, John of the Cross is in the title and the med medieval mystical tradition. Um, and, you know, so that's, so she's, I learned from her that, so John Tyler would have been translated into Latin by Lawrence Sirius, uh, like 15, uh, 49 or like 15. Um, anyways, when John of the Cross would have been like eight or nine years old, uh, John Toller was translated into Latin and then he was translated into Spanish like a couple years later, which means that when John of the Cross would have been in seminary, uh, those works would have, of John Toller would have been available to John of the Cross. And so it's a, just a, a good fa inter you know, fact to help show how John the Cross was influenced by John Tyler. And it becomes apparent when you, when you read the two. So this Benedictine nun uh, kind of points out that historical fact and then draws some parallels between the two. And just here's how she says, what she says about John Tyler. Here we come to John Tyler himself, surely one of the most attractive of mystics. I agree. <laughs> I think John Tyler is probably the most underappreciated mystic. Uh, there's great depth and clarity and nuance to his, his teaching, um, but many don't know about him or don't kind of read him enough to kind of pick up all the, the richness of his doctrine. So uh, here we come to John Tyler himself, surely one of the most attractive of mystics. It is impossible to read his sermons without carrying away the impression of a saintly priest and religious, steeped in the spirit of his order, the Dominicans, a genial, gentle person who could yet be very uncompromising when necessary, and one who had personal experience of God's ways with souls, as learned in his own case as in those of others. He possesses an insight into human nature, not inferior to that of the mystical doctor himself, John of the Cross. His style, John Tyler's style is often sheer beauty, while his homely illustrations and sense of humor are additional attractions. So that, yeah, that rings true, that captures it well. Bernard McGinn says that Tyler's mysticism is experiential and practical. It is experiential not in the modern sense of emphasizing psychological analysis of inner states, but in the sense in what we find in St. Bernard, of appealing to the hearer to inscribe within the depths of her soul the objective truth of the relation between God and, and humanity, revealed in scripture and taught by the church. Bernard McGinn, he also, he ends his treatment of Tyler in that Presence of God series. The last sentence is that um, Tyler is one of the most accessible of all mystics, because he is so kind of down to earth, he uses homely imagery, it is so concrete and practical, so he's very accessible. Uh, while also bringing us to, to the depths. Um, this is from Madame Gondilac mm -hmm. from 1946. And these are themes common to all the Rhineland mystics, Eckhart, Suso, Tyler, Roosbrook as well. The necessity of going beyond images and concepts. Well, you know, in Tyler's case, especially, you know, focusing also on being rooted in uh, image of Christ uh, in meditation. Uh, the definition of the ground, the ground of the soul as pure simplicity and as an interior fortress. So the, the third conference is we're gonna talk about, okay, so next conference we'll talk about the ground of the soul and uh, the, the depths of, of the soul and then uh, the Trinity, the indwelling Trinity. So that'll be the theme for next class. The third class will be the birth of God in the soul which is key for Eckhart and then marks all these people as well, Tyler included, the birth of God and the soul. What do we mean by that? Uh, and then from there, we'll go, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep you in suspense. For the <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the ground is key for, for all these people as pure simplicity and as an interior fortress. 
um, the hyper formation or the transformation of, of man and God. Um, the nothingness both of the creature and of the divine abyss. You know, God also is nothing. He too is no thing, right? God is not a thing. He's no thing. He's nothing in that sense. He's not one thing like among others in our world. He's, um, he's pure unbounded being um, itself, himself. Um, the positive value of testing. And, um, and finally, yeah, the freedom of spirit when we follow the Lord. Okay, so um, yeah, so key themes for for Tyler. Um, I also mentioned, you already mentioned the apostolic value of the hidden life. Um, so Tyler speaks of these, these souls, um, you know, you're very united to God. And he says this in the first sermon for the Feast of St. John the Baptist. Upon these souls, as a house upon its foundation, stands Holy Church. If they were not to, if they were not in Christendom, Christendom could not stand. The fact of their very existence among us, that they simply are, is a more honor and of greater benefit to Holy Church than a whole world of action by other Christians. Okay, so that's strong language. The mere, he says, the mere quiet repose of the soul with perfect love is of more worth to God and man than the active labors of another less perfect soul. And you see John Cross say exactly that, that same thing uh, in um, Spiritual Canticle 35, I think, somewhere in there. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Time flies. You're having fun. Um, can I have five more minutes? Okay. There we go. Um, okay. You know, quick details about John Toller's life. So that's kind of way by way of introduction, some basic themes. Um, he lives 1300, 1361, uh, age 15. He enters the Dominicans. And, uh, he enters the Dominicans in Strasbourg, Germany. And that's where he would spend most of his life. So during his life in Strasbourg, there are eight Dominican monasteries of nuns in that one city. And there are about 70, at least 70 uh, communities of Beguines in this one city. And he, you know, is ministering to all of them. Um, so John Tyler, as a young Dominican in Strasbourg would have encountered Eckhart. So Eckhart was in Strasbourg 1313 to 26. So John Toller would have entered 1315. And so he would have been 11 years in the same city with Eckhart. And had interactions with them, learned from him. He's shaped by Eckhart, takes the best of what's in Eckhart's, but you know, makes sure it's orthodox and kind of focuses it more on Christ. Tyler at one point says of Eckhart, uh, one loving master taught you about these things, but you did not understand him. He spoke from eternity and you took it as referring to time. Or he spoke from eternity, uh, but your thinking is still time bound. So that's kind of Tyler's interpretive key to understanding Eckhart and not misunderstanding him. You know, the, the soul's union with God, you know, God has you know, the eternal archetype of the soul in God, you know, God's idea of the soul that he's united with from all eternity, Eckhart kind of runs with in a strong way. We saw that in the Beguines three months ago as well, but Eckhart kind of takes it farther. And so yeah, he spoke from eternity, but you took it as referring to time. Anyway, yeah, so um, McGinn and others note that it's, it's wrong to see though Tyler as just kind of a, someone who makes Eckhart accessible, but that Tyler has an originality of his own. He's not just a popularizer of Eckhart or someone who makes Eckhart orthodox. You know, that is part of his project, but he is an original thinker on his own. And um, yeah, has value on his own right. Uh, Tyler's um, time was one of kind of strife. It's the time of the Black Death. There's economic stagnation. 
um, warfare all the time. Uh, the papal stronghold is cracking, the Avignon papacy. Um, there's a devastating earthquake and fire in 1346 that uh, Toller, you know, is you know dealing with as well. And so he does face these things and helps people to see how you find God in the midst of all this and how these things can be turned to our good. So Towler was in Strasbourg from 1300 to 1338, the first 38 years of his life. And then because of the, the strife in Germany and kind of the conflict between the state and the church, or maybe it's for whatever, for some conflict, they have to leave Strasbourg. So then Toller is in Basel, Switzerland from 1339 to 43 for four years. Because, okay, here we go. Because Dominicans are exiled for siding with the Pope instead of the emperor. So they're exiled for those four years. Uh, but then after those four years, he goes back to Strasbourg and then he spends the rest of his life there, 1343 to, to 61. So basically apart from those four years, he was in Strasbourg and then he did some traveling as well. He dies June 16th, 1361. Um, Tyler knew Mechtilds of, of Magburg's Flowing Light of the Godhead. You know, we, have, we spent a conference on her three months ago and looked at that work. So he knew that work. Um, he knew Margaret Ebner, Dominican nun. She's blessed, right? Is she beatified, Margaret Ebner? We have a letter from John Tyler uh, to Margaret Ebner, which is very kind of practical down to earth. And he mentions... Um, a piece of uh, cheese that he has sent her with the letter that he, he hopes she enjoys. <laughs> you know, a little detail like that is important to, yeah, take into account when we read John's account of like detachment from created things to realize he could enjoy a piece of cheese. And <laughs> there's a place for that in our life. <laughs> and he's giving this gift to this, this sister. Um, but yeah, you don't want to get too attached to that piece of cheese, though. <laughs> or it gets moldy as you're like holding it to your heart. Uh, you don't, want, you know, figuratively it gets moldy as you're doing that. Um, so okay, so that's that's Toller. Um, okay, so Toller's um, his sources. So Saint Augustine's important for Toller. Quotes him like forty times. Aquinas he quotes. Saint Bernard's important. Gregory the Great. Pseudo Dionysius. Uh, so that he quotes Aquinas nine times. He was named the official theologian of the Dominicans in 1309. Tyler is also influenced by Neoplatonism. Now he always kind of brings it into a, a Christian context. Proclus on the one uh, says this a darkness still silent at rest, divine beyond the senses. So that kind of language you can also you find in Neoplatonism, but then brought into a Christian context, um, it's, it rings a little different. He's influenced by the Beguines, the double abyss, like I mentioned, the sense of forsakenness at times, the storm of love. We might remember Haddock of Antwerp and the storm of love. That's taken up by Toller and also by Roosbrook. Um, Eric Kolej, who wrote the introduction to this, points out that you know one of the responses of Tyler to misinterpretations of, of Eckhart is that we need to re read Eckhart with this humble simplicity. So that's another um, role that this emphasis on um, humble simplicity uh, has in Tyler. So in Sermon 42 on Duke and Altum, Out into the Deep, uh, Tyler contrasts various mystical theologians. This is a quote from Tyler. Many masters, both old and new, have spoken of this inward excellence which lies hidden in the depths of the soul. Bishop Albert, Albert the Great, Master Dietrich, and Master Eckhart. One of them calls it a spark of the soul, another a plane or a peak, another a, a principle. And then in that same sermon, he goes on then to talk about, well, the true way to blessedness is a way of humility. And then he quotes the Lord Jesus, learn of me for I am meek and humble of heart. And um, reminds the listeners that it's the father who has revealed his mysteries to the childlike. childlike. 
All right, so let me just end right with one more. Okay, I'll just mention really quick. Um, McGinn notes in Toller there are kind of three key essential attitudes, turning, releasing, receiving. This is just way a summary, a good kind of way to catch um, significant things throughout uh, Toller's spiritual doctrine. Turning, releasing, receiving. <clears throat> so turning, turning to God alone, converting, turning within, recollecting, um, a unified disposition of turning to the Lord. A number two, releasing. You know, that's detachment, being released from our over um, attachment to created things, a releasing from self as well and selfishness and self-love, releasing another key movement and power, another key attitude and power. Um, and then receiving. You know, he speaks a lot about the emptiness of the soul, that we need to you know, enter into this emptiness, this poverty of spirit, and it's all for the sake of receiving. Empty and free to receive God. Um, so yeah, so turning, releasing, receiving, that's kind of a nice summary. Of, uh, um, in a sermon entitled um, Signs of a True Scholar of Christ, he takes up the line of Jesus, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. And that kind of sets the stage. This is how you enter into the spiritual life, this is how you end the spiritual life. So that's pages 149 to 50, 51. So again, Christ is here at the center. He himself is our book, Toller says, the Lord Jesus. He himself is our book, open, easy to read, and written with the plainest letters. In his lesson, it reads thus, learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart. And he also mentions Mary, his beloved mother, the, and the humility of the handmaid. Okay, so it's the last thing. Um, Something great about Haller, and it builds on this, um, is that, um, yeah, it's, he helps us to enter into kind of this living faith. So again, you know, doing everything we do, not just as robots or just externally going through the motions, but um, entering into things with a living faith. In one sermon, he contrasts masters of learning uh, with masters of living. And so that's actually McGinn's title to his chapter on um, Tyler is the the Lieb, I, I don't know Jeremy, so the, the Lieb Meister, Leb, Leb Meister, uh, L E B Meister, Master of Living. Um, so this is from that sermon. Dear children, the great clerics and masters of learning dispute about whether knowledge or love is greater or nobler. But here we want to speak about the masters of living when we come there um, and so forth. So I mean, you know, there, there's obviously a place for study and the intellect and, and John Tyler, but he, he is kind of wary of, um, a, you know, late medieval scholasticism sometimes that was detached from um, the life of faith and maybe got into too much subtleties. Um, so yeah, he's yeah. So he's a master of living. That's a good way to think about him. Um, and he helps us to enter into this living faith, and he expresses it in beautiful ways. Um, he says, "And what is living faith?" This is seven seventy four, page seven seventy four. And what is living faith? Nothing else but a living taste for God and for all that savors of God. A man may hear and read things that belong to our holy faith as about our Lord's divinity or humanity or the blessed Trinity, but he has a living faith within him if interiorly he knows that God is and when that it is interiorly more plain to him than all his teachers can say. The reality of God is more you know, alive to him interiorly and this because he lives and dwells in the interior kingdom. There does this life of faith pour forth its living waters from its own fountainhead. So Tyler helps us to enter into this living faith from which we drink from these living waters. 
Those souls who abide in the life that is within know well of the interior movements of God and of his truth as to what befalls them in the outer life that also makes us fit for God, ever newly awakening their inner life, now with holy purposes, now with deeper love, again with praise and thanksgiving to God. This is life, this life is within them. They live in a divine interior kingdom. They savor God in everything. And now God, this is 735. And now God is exalted in the soul in his sovereign wisdom and the soul itself is proportionally sunk down before him in the littleness of its understanding. And this state abides in the soul even as it's occupied in his day-to-day -day activities. Thus united to God's wisdom and much simplicity, he attains to the immensity of the deity amid the darkness of his unknown being. Um, he is a simple being. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, he is, God is. God is a simple being to whom the created human faculties cannot attain, but to whom they may be united through the work of grace, namely supernatural faith, hope, and charity. Um, okay, anyways, yeah, so, <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, we'll, we'll continue this afternoon, and we'll look at, um, if you, if you have some time, and you want to, yeah, we never quite got to the sermon I wanted to, <laughs> but you, I think you saw how it was related. It's a good sermon that shows how the vocal prayer uh, needs to be enlivened with that deeper uh, search and yearning for God. Uh, next class this afternoon, pages 362 to 67, the Trinity in the interior life. 362 to 67. And then um, 428 to 33, giving God good measure also is, is related to it. Um, and then actually we'll, we'll begin next class with um, vocal prayer contemplation kind of pick up some things from the sermon uh, you read for this class today so okay so uh, Lord uh, we ask you to continue our, our journey help us to sink into the depths the depths of our own soul to find you uh, the depths of, of your being the depths of your love And help us, Lord, to, to, to know how to do that step by step as, as you lay hold of our hearts. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're off to a good start. Yeah. Any questions as you're leaving? Very good.